How's it going, everybody? And thank you for joining me on Out of the Bothros for Weekly Word Wednesday. So last week we were reading about uh, immorality and lawsuits between members of the church in chapters 5 and 6 out of 1 Corinthians. And so this week we're going to go ahead and go through chapter 7. Um, this section here is Paul's teaching on uh, marriage and how we should conduct ourselves in a marriage relationship. So we're going to go ahead and start in verse 1 in chapter 7. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except by a mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am. But each man has his own gifts from God. One has this gift and another that. Verse 8. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Verse 10. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Verse 12. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy." Verse 15, But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such, such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Verse 17, Nevertheless, each one of you should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freed man. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man is responsible to God. Each man, as responsible to God, should remain in the situation God called him to. Now about virgins, verse 25. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. 
But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you from this. Verse 29. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none, those who mourn as if they do not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. Verse 32, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Verse 36. If anyone thinks he is acting improperly towards the virgin he is engaged to, and if she is getting along in years, and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does even better. Verse 39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. So in verse 7, Paul is speaking to both married and unmarried people and giving examples on how married people should live and the idea that if you're not married... You actually have less to worry about, and you should be focusing 100% on the Lord. We always should be trying to strive for what it is that the Lord is asking of us. But sometimes when we have become married, we have a lot of things that we have to take into consideration as far as how to please our wives or husbands, as well as try to keep a godly household. So that can become difficult, especially when one of our spouses may be off and not necessarily following the will of God, because we'll become very divided in how our household maintains itself. And we can become a little bit conflicted on how to do the will of God while also keeping peace within our house. So it says in the very beginning that when you do become married, you've actually given up your own body to your spouse. And so in that, you both have the obligation, in a sense, to make sure that the other person is has their needs met both sexually and emotionally. And it says here that in the very beginning few, uh, verse, few verses of the chapter here that because of the way that sexual immorality is running rampant, that if we have a tendency towards um, sexual desire, that we should be married so that way we can fulfill a unsinful way of meeting that desire. Now, it's not necessary for us to become married, uh, especially in the sense where if, if we can control ourselves and our sexual desire does not constantly cause issue within ourselves, that it would be better for us to stay single in the sense that our mind can be set 100% on following the will of God. <clears throat> 
it says here that once we do become married, that really the only reason to not have sexual um, contact with our spouse or have that kind of intimacy is when we're devoting ourselves to prayer. So there may be a situation that comes up that we do need to be in deep prayer and fasting from certain things. So in that sense, in that time, we should actually go ahead and discontinue through discussion and through um, mutual agreement that during this time of fasting and prayer that we do not have sexual contact with our spouse. But to make sure that we all agree on a, a time when we should come back together because if we have the tendency in the first place to have to be married and have to fulfill our sexual need, that Satan will use that against us. And it may be a certain time where if we're allowing that desire to kind of well up with inside of us and we're not seeking our spouse to release that um, in a fashion that God has set up so that we're not sinning because we're actually engaging in a sexual relationship that he condones. But in that sense, when we separate ourselves and allow that to well up, Satan might tempt us with immorality and sexual tendencies that are against God. So to not allow that to become too much of a time so that we don't end up seeking pornography uh, homosexual tendency, um, prostitution, and all of those other things that are against God's way of having proper sexual intercourse. <clears throat> and it says here that being married is not a sin for any person. That includes the regular mundane person as well as all the way up to the priest. And in a sense, in, in previous verses um, and in later verses, each individual is actually a priest in the sense that we have become descendants of all the blessings of Abraham and of our Lord Jesus Christ by his sacrifice. It says in verses 8, Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. So in the sense, if they have the ability to quail that desire um, simply by releasing it without committing some kind of immorality, basically just fluffing it off and forgetting the thought, if they have that ability, then they should remain unmarried so that they can focus 100% on devotion to God. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. So we can see here that most of the reason to marry in the first place is because of our inability to control ourselves. So if we don't have the ability to forget about sex altogether, we should be married. Simply so that we don't burn with passion because that creates a situation where we're constantly being bombarded by temptation. And if we allow that ability to build up, because of our fleshly nature, there's going to be a tendency for us to make a mistake. In later verses here, after verse 10, To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. In this situation, I know that a lot of teachings now say that under certain circumstances, it's okay to be divorced. Um, but we can see that Paul is getting the commandment from the Lord that this is actually not true, that a wife should not separate from her husband in any circumstance. And if she does separate from herself, she is still married to that man and should remain unmarried because of the situation where it commits an adulterous situation. Uh, Jesus himself said that if a man marries a divorced woman, in any sense, whether she's divorced him or the man has divorced the woman, that that new husband is committing adultery. And also in the sense that it says here in the command that a woman should remain un, 
unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. If she divorces her husband or if the husband divorces the wife out of anger or lack of interest or any situation, we can actually see this with the story of Samson, where later on he realizes maybe he does still want his wife or he still does want to fix the relationship in some way. If she has become married again and that man has not passed away, there's no way for that reconciliation to happen. And in a sense, she would have to divorce the other man to reconcile back with the original husband. And this creates a situation where neither one of the people um, can, especially the woman in this circumstance, can actually fulfill the commandment of God. And so the second man, in a sense, is actually closing the door on both of their abilities to follow the will of God. So I would say that with some of the later teachings that are being taught now, be very careful with what is happening. It says here, too, that and a husband may, must not divorce his wife. So again, here, it doesn't really give any leniency towards the situation. As we understand, as it was from the beginning, that when you marry, you become one flesh. And so in that sense, you are one individual between two people. And so when you divorce, you're actually ripping a piece of yourself off. And that's not the way that God had constructed marriage in the first place. So when we do do this, we are misrepresenting what it is that he is saying. We also understand that even if the other person is not a believer and they're not in any sense wanting to divorce and they, they want to continue living in a relationship with the believing spouse, that in those circumstances we are also not to separate ourselves. It says in later verses, or in later verse here, in verse 15, but if the unbeliever, so in this situation we understand that if there is someone that leaves the relationship, they're the ones being considered the unbeliever in this sense. Because if we say that we love God and we love Jesus, we're going to go ahead and follow his will. And he's telling us not to divorce. So in that situation, we are basically, if we do choose to take that option, pretty much not listening to the, man, the commands of God and doing our own will. So in that sense, we're either acting similar to the Pharisees or we're acting like unbelievers altogether. It says in those circumstances, when that person does choose to leave, that we're not bound to those circumstances. So... What he's trying to say here, I believe, is that if they do choose to leave, carry on your life and go ahead and continue to do the things of God and what he asks. That also means not to commit adultery, not to commit more sexual immorality, and to go ahead and follow what it is that the Word of God is. And to focus on continuing to remain in the situation. It says here in verse 17, Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. So in this situation, this goes for all things. If we are employees, if we are um, managers, if we are owners of businesses, if we are married, if if any circumstance when God called us, we are supposed to remain in that situation. I believe for multiple reasons, uh, but for one reason, God has fulfilled us with a purpose to do his will. And he wants his will to be shown in all circumstances. So when we're all put in different places and called to God, we are supposed to do the best that we can as if we're doing everything for the Lord. And so in that circumstance, the employee that is a believer can show the owner, and the owner that's a believer 
can show the employee, the husband of the unbeliever, and the wife of the unbeliever. Everyone has their own place in order to represent our Lord Jesus Christ and to show that in every circumstance that God has put us, put us in, we can show the power of God and do the absolute best in all of our situations. So that way we can show true prosperity in whatever place we've been put in. <clears throat> It says here, even in verse 21, were you a slave when you were called? Do not let it trouble you. The place you were put in when you were called is there for the Lord. So don't allow it to upset you. The only time that we should really try and stop something is when we notice that it is an outright sin. And in those situations, we should do the things of the Lord. And in our best situation... Um, fulfill the will of God and to do what it is that he asks and he does say to stop sinning he's constantly telling people in every situation to discontinue sinning so in those situations we should stop when we realize that anything in our lifestyle is a sin we should stop that situation but that doesn't mean trying to change all of our circumstances so if you're a poor person of course, go out there, do the best you can, allow for income to come, but don't ever worry about becoming wealthy and or rich. You just constantly keep doing the best you can and let the power of God build upon itself. And again, if you are rich, you should do the things of God, which is to help the poor, but don't necessarily look to um, be a poor person in that sense. Now, God does ask a rich man to sell all his belongings and give it to the poor, but that doesn't immediately make him poor. He doesn't tell him to quit his job or anything like that or quit the skills that he has. He just tells him to sell all of his things in a sense that, like in the later verse here, let's see here. Here we are. We'll start in, in verse 26. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin married, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in life. And I want to spare you from this. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. And those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it was not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if, as if it is not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. So don't hold on to material possessions. Um, that includes other individuals as well, as well as people. Because of the sense that Everything has a time and a place where it will pass away, including the whole earth. So in that sense, if someone is in need and we have something to give them, just give it up. The rich man was holding on to all of his wealth and all of his possessions and all of his things and hoarding them. So with that, Jesus looked into his heart and noticed that it would be very difficult for him to follow Jesus because he was not willing to treat his possessions as things of God and not as his own. So Paul's telling us to not allow ourselves to become in that situation. He's also letting us know that because of the present crisis, so what that means is in, in all the situations, including now and, and in past times, there's a lot of chaos going along, uh, around. There's a lot of people committing sins. There's a lot of people not following the will of God. There's a lot of people who don't even believe in God and are following their own idols and their own ideas. 
So with that, we have to be very careful with the ways that we conduct ourselves as not to fall into similar situations. So with that, in the present time, wait for Jesus to come and tell you exactly what it is that You, you don't change the situation you're in because you might actually find yourself in a situation um, where you've put yourself outside of the will of God if you're not careful and you're not vigilant, you're not constantly keeping a sober mind and paying attention to what it is you're doing. You can find yourself out of God by constantly switching based off of emotion, based off of feelings, uh, based off of what you think would be better for you, and it may be outside the will of God. And... When Jesus comes, you may find yourself in a situation where you didn't have a relationship with him. And so he may say to you, I never knew you. So with that situation, we need to be constantly understanding that we need to follow the will of God. And if God called us in the place that we are, we should do our best to continue to stay in that place. And again, it says to build upon your talents. And we have parables from previous uh, verses in the, the Synoptic Gospels, that we are supposed to improve on the things that God has given us. We are supposed to constantly improve our skills, improve our abilities uh, in all senses, so that when God comes, we can show that we were doing His work, and we can actually um, not be considered... Um, Forget the exact term, but we, we prove ourselves to be good stewards of the things that God has given us. And in that sense, those abilities will show outstanding. Uh, when Joseph was in prison, um, you know, he didn't sulk in himself and he didn't go ahead. He, he still, when he had a suggestion or showed somebody something, he did it just because of the fact that these were skills given to him. And no matter what situation he was in, he was going to use the talents that God had given him because they are God's. And we should be giving back to him through our ability to help other people and to improve the lives of other people around us. And in that, we'll have our own um, praise from God and we'll have our own uh, rewards in whatever situation it is that God feels to reward us. And we shouldn't have a set idea of what those rewards are because the greatest reward of all time is what Jesus did for us on the cross. And the fact that we actually now have the ability to cast off our sin and to reconcile ourselves to God and be in fellowship with our Father. And this goes for all situations. Um, and again, it says here that in the marriage situation... We shouldn't be casting people out, and we shouldn't be um, just because of our own anger or our own whatever situation comes up that causes divorce, all kinds of reasons, financial issues, uh, just disagreements in any sense. We're supposed to be forgiving people. We're supposed to be loving people. We're supposed to be kind to other people, supposed to be gentle, supposed to not delight in evil. And God finds divorce as an evil situation. There was a time where he chose to divorce, um, in the illustration, he, devo he divorced uh, Israel because they were acting like all the other people around them. And in that sense, the divorce situation was actually for them to have time separated from God, to realize their... Realize where they were slipping up and making mistakes. And those who chose to reconcile with the husband in this sense was God, um, could come back to him. But it wasn't about pushing them off to find a better spouse. It wasn't about pushing them off uh, necessarily to punish them. But it was in a sense that you're making such a bad mistake that... I have to cut this piece of myself off because of the fact that you're causing sin. And God won't associate with 
won't embrace sin. So with that situation, this was the one time that he actually did divorce. But because of the situation where we're supposed to forgive like God, we got to be careful not to do that. Because when we do cast somebody out and we do push them off and we do get a, a divorce for whatever reason, we're actually causing a situation where they may not be, none of us are perfect. So they may actually continue um, to fall short and without having that marital relationship where there's one person who's strong in the word of God, um, especially if, if you get remarried and everything like that, and that person doesn't have the ability to reconcile, we're actually setting up a situation where we can't forgive the person and they can't receive forgiveness. So in that situation, do everything you can uh, not to be the one person who is unforgiving, unloving, and unkind and pushes them out. Because there can be a situation where we're acting ungodly even though we think we're following the representation of God. In that situation, um, there are certain circumstances where there's actually only one, and that's sexual immorality. In a sexual immorality situation, it is actually said to divorce the person. But that, in a sense, is actually to make to give them the realization that they have separated themselves from a right standing with God. And to leave room, in all honesty, for there to be a reconciliation situation, whatever that looks like in the future. But as Paul is saying, whatever you do, follow the will of God. Do not separate from one another and to stay as one unit as it was in the beginning. We also see later on that it may not be necessary to get married. Um, even in the situation where you're engaged to one another, if, if you both are keeping yourself pure and you're both keeping yourself holy... And you both, one of you decides that it, it would be better not to get married because it's going to take away from your relationship with God. There's nothing sinful about that. As well as there's nothing sinful about the two of you becoming one unit and both following God together. And both walking with God and actually having a fellowship in a marriage situation. Um, we all do need some kind of fellowship, some kind of com companionship, whether that's uh, friendship in the church, or that's a husband and wife relationship. It is said here, just like Jesus said when he was talking um, to his disciples, when I believe it was Peter who asks, wouldn't it be better for a man? You know, some of you can follow this teaching um, that yes, there's going to be a lot of strife and a lot of difficulties in a marriage because the two of you are to stay together. And there will be times where you don't like each other and you're upset with each other. And, you know, a certain way somebody performs something may upset you. Maybe one person likes to come home and watch TV. Another person likes to come home and have a moment to themselves. Um, you'll find tendencies. Maybe one of you snores. Maybe one of you, you know... Uh, leaves the bathroom seat up. There's all kinds of situations, and I mean, these are, are minuscule things to what may happen. Um, some of you may honestly misuse money and cause situations where uh, it becomes financially difficult because of the way one person flipper, uh, you know, spends without thinking and the other person's trying to save money. There's a lot of situations that are going to cause argument in a marriage relationship and to think very carefully about not only the spouse you're taking, um, but also whether or not you're the kind of person who requires that marriage relationship. But once you do get married, realize that it's going to be a difficult struggle and that you both are in it together. And you should find ways to ease each other's pain through companionship and both working for the betterment of each other. 
but that is a difficult situation and will cause times where, you know, we're not supposed to, ha we're supposed to put off all of our rage and jealousy and malice. And in a marriage relationship, there's going to be tendencies to have jealousy of, uh, the spouse you may want to have with you and they're spending their time doing other things, whether that's a job, their friendships, um, their hobbies, they may cause jealousy issue within you. And, you know, we're supposed to put that off. So it's very difficult to follow the will of God while having these things happen, as well as things that may anger us in that situation. So, um, just realize that marriage is difficult, and once we do marry, it is our command not to separate from each other. So go ahead and think that through fully. Work with the person you're engaged to or the person you're already married to, and try and figure out the best way to live with each other without removing yourself from what it is that God has asked us. And take very carefully the commands of God. And do your very best to, even when one of you wants to leave, to sit down with that other spouse, have a conversation, and figure out how to work through it. Because the two of you are one unit now, and it is in your both of your best interests to work through problems instead of just trying to remove yourself from the situation. God calls us to stay in the situation we were in when we were called, and that goes for all things, including marriage. So as I close here, um, I want to speak to married people and say that um, marriage is something that was given to us as a blessing of God in order to give us full companionship and give us a uh, leniency towards sexual tendency. So with that, honor God with the blessing that he had given us and realize that your spouse is a blessing to you in every situation. So... Do your best to honor each other and to honor God through your relationship. And to those people who are not married, if it's okay for you to continue to be unmarried, honor God in the way that you live and stay as holy as possible and every day strive for the purposes that God has given you. So as I close, if you guys have any comments, if you guys are in a marriage and want to discuss to other people who are married about things that may come up in your marriage or um, maybe some skills that you guys have learned in order to continue to live in peace with each other and continue to press on through the battles and temptations that we all face. And to those of you that are still single, um, maybe there's some things you can say to each other that will encourage each other to keep working towards the will of God. And if you guys have any comments about these verses, uh, my interpretations of them, go ahead and leave your comments in the bottom section. And if you guys do get an opportunity, go ahead and subscribe because I'll continue to make these videos continuously every week um, and try and speak to each other and have fellowship with each other so that we're constantly in a relationship with one another, brother, family member, we're all here for each other and we're all here for our own encouragement and to build up the kingdom of God. So I love you guys and I'll be seeing you guys next week. Have a good one.